Good day. It's Monday, April the 19th. I'm Martin Gago with Radius Research. Today, we're joined by Dan Legault, CEO of Antibe Therapeutics, ATE on the TSX Exchange. I'm getting to the deep dive with Dan. Um, on your, you've got 70 million on your uh, balance sheet right now. Does that include the upfront payment from Nuance or is that still coming in? No, that includes the upfront from Nuance, 26 right. million. All right. And uh, back in December, sort of starting on the bigger picture of things, you an announced that there's going to be an integration or a, you're working towards integrating Antibe Holdings, which holds a bunch of the IP into Antibe Therapeutics. Is there an update you can give us at this point on how that process is, is moving forward? Uh, uh, sure. And, and just for context, um, so, so many biotechs, most really, um, come out of uh, university discoveries, as did ours, and and so often you you um, you get a license from the, the university for IP. Instead, uh, our our founder started um, a small company as he was the inventor and did a did a very similar uh, university like um, uh, transfer uh, license to to the public company. But since uh, um, that that is a friendly private company that holds the, the modest license or, excuse me, owns the IP. We have long thought that we should amalgamate these two. It provides a cleaner uh, structure for these large uh, partnerships that we're uh, looking forward. So we decided to do this. We've been discussing this for a long time and have uh, notified the market for years. That is now, uh, that is now happening. And it's, there's a little modest little bureaucracy of, of both uh, the boards of both companies. Um, uh, needing to negotiate this, that has now been done, and uh, with fairness opinions from independent investment banks. So, so we're getting to near, near the end of the process. I can't really tell you uh, much more than that, but um, and, but we are keeping the the, the the market updated on that, and and uh, we hope to have uh, announcements soon on that process. Would that be a Q2 event, or could it spill over into Q3 when you say up coming soon? It, it, it could be a Q2. Uh, uh, um, it could be a Q2 event. These things have their own little way of moving, you know, uh, methodically because there's a lot of uh, legals involved, of course. But it could be a Q2 event. On uh, SETI, over the last uh, in March, largely you, you and some other insiders of the company did some buying uh, private transactions. Could one guess that this is maybe a bit of a coordination set up or restructuring things to, uh, as part of the um, uh, NT Holdings transaction or? To... Yes, that is a good explanation for it. Um, uh, uh, Martin, a, a number of the insiders, including myself and, and John Wall, um, uh, held a, a bunch of equity uh, um, <clears throat> uh, in, in holdings and, and, uh, and which in turn equity in, in, in a therapeutic, so it's all it, it, it's all a restructuring, um, and 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 by the setting rules, of course, that all gets uh, gets put on to set I as an acquisition of shares. Okay, all right. Um, I don't I, I know how to say ATB three forty six, but all ten up. I, I I don't want to say it too badly, so I'm just refer to it as the ATB three forty six until I, I can wrap my tongue around it. Um, you've announced that you're expecting. Um, the phase three to start in the uh, second half of the year. Can you go over what are some of the milestones or, or achievements you need to accomplish before you can start the, the phase uh, three trial itself? Sure. So last uh, last November, uh, and in an update that we gave, we also provided in January, um, we, we announced that we're going to push off until the second half of the year, the start of the phase three. That was primarily for um, to take into account pandemic because it's very very hard to to uh, put your thumb against the the sky and, and judge um, judge the pandemic. Look at the look at the issues um, in Canada that we're facing right at the moment, whereas the United States is uh, is getting vaccinations under control. All this was an unknown in, in November and January, so we decided to go at the, at the last half of uh, of the year. Um, because uh, the, the bulk of it is going to be in, in the United States, although there will, so about 40 or 50 hospitals in the United States and about 10 in Canada. So, we're, so we, we just wanted to get uh, past uh, COVID. We did decide to do a, uh, uh, um, 
a, a study in Canada that needs to be done in parallel with your phase three program. There are always these phase one studies that need to be done. So we decided to I expand that and get that done um, in, in the interim. So we're not sort of appreciably uh, lo losing time. In terms of um, milestones, we, we um, want to um, finish that, that, that study and then, um, um, of course, meet with the FDA to discuss uh, the full phase three program. And that would also occur in the um, uh, in, around the sep September or, or, or later time frame. So, so you know, the precursor is the um, the end of phase two meeting with the with the FDA, and we'll keep the market informed on that. All right. And is that being uh, if it wasn't for COVID beyond the bureaucracy, maybe? But um, could have you started phase three? the trial aspect earlier, or if people weren't sick and people afraid of COVID and that, or is it, this is just the natural progression of going from phase two to phase three and it, things are slowed down a bit but because of the COVID, but basically it would have started up in the, the second half uh, anyways, or did you delay because you're hoping to get COVID under control before, or it, COVID gets under we, control. We, 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 did do, we did delay uh, due to COVID. There, I mean, I mean, having said that, there is a, uh, a lot of work they have to do between phase two and phase three, which often the market doesn't fully appreciate. There are about nine or 10 um, long range toxicity studies that you need to do in animals. It's a complex thing to get your phase three compound in bills done. We've been working uh, on that for two years. And, um, um, and of course, there are these regulatory steps. Having said all that, we were we are on track, and 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 those um, have been on schedule. So, so uh, had we not made that decision back in November, we could have started uh, the phase three um, in a couple of months or so. But we did decide to do this phase one now and push everything uh, off because of COVID. All right. With the um, you recently announced the IND with uh, the uh, uh, FDA. Um, is that generally considered a big milestone or is that more of a um, uh, sort of a bureaucratic sort of just getting through the process or uh, how much of a de-risking event was that? Do you see it? Oh, at this point, I don't think it a, a, a huge de-risking <clears throat> event. The United States uh, respects uh, um, in Canada, of course, and, and, and vice versa. Uh, generally speaking, um, if you're, for example, uh, an American company, um, IND is is this the point of it, it's the equivalent of being uh, getting approval for your first in human study, um, and, and that's generally uh, the, how most people understand the IND to be. Uh, it's it's a bit more sophisticated than that, but of course we did our first in human studies in Canada, so. Um, uh, <clears throat> And so now we are, when the IND is opening up the file for human studies in the United States, uh, we, we expected to get our IND because after all, we've already done a whole series of human studies in, in Canada. But not, nonetheless, it's a, it, 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 is a, it, is a, it was a nice um, uh, approval to, to receive. Uh, I, I would point out that, uh, that our application for our IND was 55,000 pages because we had to uh, provide all of the data for all of the clinical trials to date and all of our non-clinical program. And we are significantly advanced. We finished phase two effectively. So it was a very, very large uh, IND filing, um, um, but not, but it was more or less, it, I think it's fair to say. All right. Can you walk us through, uh, assuming uh, things progress as expected and uh, what is the rough timeline of the phase three trial? It'll start in H2 and then, when do we get, like, how long does the trial run for? When do we get maybe preliminary data? Can you walk us through that, the rough timeline on, on the phase three? Sure. Um, so a phase three is a program. Uh, we, we anticipate three, possibly four um, studies. So two pain effectiveness studies, very, very similar to what we uh, did in our phase two, but rather than weeks for 12 weeks duration, and then one GI safety study, possibly two, but we had such good results on our on our uh, on our phase two that we think only one will be required. Um, and this one will be not for two weeks, but for six months. So those are the, the three studies. They'll start in a bit of a staggered uh, fashion. 
So the first one will start in, in the latter half of this year, uh, post September, and um, that, 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 it all depends on on re recruitment. Of course, that is the the, the the dominant parameter that affects the the duration of these uh, of these trials. Um, so it's it's about an eleven to fourteen month um, process. Since this first trial is a multi dose. Step, uh, to explore the lower ends of the dose, we will have um, a, a data readout for an independent statistical monitoring committee, but there is some uh, potential information coming out um, about seven months after that starts. And then we would start our second uh, study. And then um, about six months after that, start the, uh, start the GI safety study. All told is about a two and a half year program, I suspect. All right. And uh, you've got 70 million on the, the books. Is that 70 million can handle that two and a half year program with your burn rate and with your other uh, projects going forward? Or um, how does the, the runway look with your balance sheet? If we dedicated all of that money, um, it, it, it would be able to handle that. Um, the two and a half, but first of all, the two and a half year starts uh, when the phase three uh, starts. So it's a bit longer than that. We have about two and a half years of money. We are going to put some money onto our the other uh, candidates. They don't take a whole lot of money. Um, uh, so, but for all intents and purposes, we're, we're virtually funded for our whole program. I mean, should our first study, the big, uh, the big if, should it be, or the big should, should it be successful? Of course, um, that would be a, a, a major a value inflection point. And so we no longer think of uh, uh, capital markets as, as, um, as uh, a particularly uh, a great problem, nor would can the market expect uh, much of any uh, dilution going forward. And we're also in, in partnering efforts as, as well. But we, we do want to take some of that money and move it on to broadening our, our pipeline. These don't take a whole lot of money and they're extraordinarily exciting. Is there an opportunity with uh, the 346 that, like a new one still, you may license it out to some other regions uh, in the meantime, or is that going to be more kind of put on hold until you start getting some uh, data out and you, you hopefully de-risk the project? Well, the project is, there's a lot of it has been just de-risked. Um, we finished our phase two after all. Oh, yeah. uh, so phase two is generally speaking human proof of concept. And so we are embarked on, on discussions already with um uh, with with pharma companies for the larger pharma markets and and uh, so 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 absolutely there's a, a, a there's a, a nice chance of, of a deal in the next uh, 10, 10 months or so. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah I mean that I mean, gener generally, Martin, th th this is the, the opportune time for um, for uh, partnering. It's it's usually done uh, post phase two. Of course, the longer you go, the more value you're you're building. Um, yeah. But this is, um, you know, our, our, our phase two, we did particularly large uh, de-risking trials already. Yeah. How large is the trial when you're going from phase two to phase three? Like, um, yeah, how, how many people are involved in, in the trial? Uh, they're, they're larger, but they're not appreciably larger than the studies that we already did. Those were pretty large phase two studies. I mean, we're going to... We're going for the, the big mountain. We're trying to become, we're trying to climb, um, you know, become a blockbuster uh, drug. Uh, uh, we would be best in class on, on the NSAID category and 2 billion people take these drugs. So, so, so that's why we did particularly large and rigorous phase two trials. So the, so the phase three trials in terms of um, people would be uh, larger, but not appreciably more. Uh, the main thing is that they'd be of longer duration. So the pain trials would go to 12 weeks instead of two weeks and the GI safety would go to uh, 24 weeks instead of uh, two weeks. Okay. Um, are you aware of other uh, drugs in the pipeline that are addressing the, the GI issues with um, NSAIDs uh, that are in the phase two, phase three uh, uh, pathway as well at this point by your competitors? And no, we're not. There's no new composition of matter NSAID in, in the development uh, in the development pipeline, all this becomes a matter of public record. So it's relatively e easy to see there. there, As I mentioned, there have been a, over the past 50 years, a whole slew of efforts 
have gone into trying to solve this problem. But the same thing that gives you inflammatory pain relief is what causes the ulcers. And so it has been a very difficult problem to solve. Um, there are some combination drugs that are not selling well. Uh, they, they, they are modestly better in the stomach, but provide some worse um, effects in, in, the, in the intestines, for example. So there's not that much activity. There is, um, uh, you know, there's always development around in, injections and that sort of thing, but all, all the, com the large commercial houses are all projecting NSAIDs to be um, ma a massive market for the next 20, 30 years. So we're, we're, we're not worried about that. I think it's fair to say for your uh, viewers, Martin, that competitive pressures are not uh, our, our um, dominant risk. Uh, the risk is classic biotech, which is development risk. You know, we've only been in uh, humans for, for two weeks and, and yet we're becoming a chronic. We've done a lot of uh, de-risking, but it, it is biotech. So there's always risk. And so we think the, 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 the classic development risk is, um, is, uh, is more relevant than competitive risk. On a, on a personal note, I'm just curious with NSAIDs and causing GI issues. When I take like my ibuprofen or sometimes naproxen, like after working out or feeling sore and painful, and I, I seem to have no issues with my GI that I can feel, does that mean I'm safe or could I still be getting ulcers in my stomach and being unaware of it at, at this point and then one day I'm going to be aware of it? These are... Per, these are uh, these drugs have their issues and the, and the issues are, are serious. Um, uh, Martin, you get ulcers after seven days. Um, in, in our study, I, I showed you the three millimeter slide just uh, 10 minutes ago, but, uh, but on our website, on the fuller deck, you can see the five millimeter slide. These are holes in your stomach where you bleed to death or you're, if you're uh, lucky, you, you, know, you wake up in the ICU after having had three whole units of blood in, 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 in our study. Uh, we had zero of those, whereas naproxen, which is just so, so common, uh, it's Aleve under over the counter with the brand name of Aleve. 24% um, of people had a five millimeter ulcer, 42% had a three millimeter ulcer. So uh, these things, um, and they're insidious, particularly in, in the intestine where the, the bulk of the bleeding happens, um, it's insidious. You often don't get any, um, uh, uh, you know any signals that, that that you're not feeling that you're not feeling well. So you have to be um, you have to be careful with these of these drugs. If you're taking these drugs longer than seven days, you should be uh, you know your doctor should be monitoring you. I'm, I'm, and well, this is the last one on sort of the product technology stuff. Another thing with the NSAIDs and that they they say they uh, it kind of messes up your microbiome and your 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 stomach and your GI system. Is um, the FDA or part of your trials at all looking at the microbiome? It seems to be sort of a hot topic in uh, the world of health and and that is that part of the the calculus when uh, evaluating your drugs. Well, that's a fantastic uh, question, M Martin. Um, so we're, pursu we're pursuing a, a relatively standard and conservative regulatory path um, and, and, uh, and because we want to be conservative from, from a regulatory um, po point of view and we'll, we'll meet all uh, no normal um, regulatory uh, <laughs> uh, endpoints. But from a scientific point of view, we're well versed in that. Uh, our panoply of scientists are, are some of the experts in the microbiome. Um, the microbiome is clearly uh, very, very relevant to NSAIDs in ways that are, are not particularly well known. We're actively uh, studying it. You know, for for <laughs> for most of fifty years, doctors could not see the intestine. You can't get a scope either way. <laughs> um, into, into the intestine, only the stomach. And so, so for the better part of 50 years, it's been more viewed as a stomach issue, but there's greater bleeding, greater mortality, um, and, um, you know, in the, in, in, the, uh, in the intestine. And now we can see the intestine with a video capsule, a little TV camera and a pill. So doctors are starting to become more um, aware of the intestine and um, and the the biome is particularly relevant to the intestine. As a matter of fact, I mentioned the, the combination drugs. You know, for for decades now, doctors have often co-prescribed 
um, what they think of as a GI sparing drug, such as a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor. These are acid reflux control drugs. Uh, we were the first to show that they make, they provide some protection in the stomach, but they make intestinal damage dramatically worse because of screwing up the biome and actually killing bacteria now known to be beneficial in, in defense. And, um, and that has been rep replicated in a whole series of human studies with video capsule endoscopy. So you are absolutely right. We're, we are all over that and, and, and sort of on the, um, on the edge of that, uh, um, but many scientific groups are, are working on that as well. The microbiome is extremely important um, and, and is, it is one of the ways uh, that, um, why we think why we were so for, why we believe in our drugs so so much. From a regulatory point of view, though, we will um, do a more conservative classic approach. And and so is some of your data that you've have internally or published. Does it show that it's been, let's say, microbiome friendly? Is that some of the preliminary data you you've had to date? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, in, in in animals, not in humans, of course. Uh, um, um, but in, in animals, yes, we have uh, um, uh, published data on that. In a two-year series of experiments published um, in, a, in a series of articles that has been called elegant <laughs> in the scientific literature, which is a very supreme comp um, compliment that scientists give one another. Uh, John Wallace's work, uh, our, our work at um, uh, has was the first to show that these PPIs um, uh, make um, intestinal damage dramatically worse. And we showed why, and it is because of messing up the microbiome. All right, okay. Um, could we, I'd like to switch over to the uh, ATB 352, the acute pain that I guess is the potential better substitute for opioids for uh, acute pain hospital uh, uh, type pain. Um, could you just talk about where you are on that project and? Maybe what kind of news we could maybe hear from you through the remainder of the year or the next 12 months? Uh, sure. So um, uh, we, we have now uh, finished our animal proof of concept studies and we have started uh, our IND enabling studies. We've done several models of pain and, um, and, and several models of GI uh, safety. And so we're now uh, going to move that drug rapidly uh, forward. And, and at the same time, since uh, we're farther behind in that drug as a small company. The bulk of our resources of the past few years has gone to our lead drug because they all use similar technology. Um, uh, we're also um, uh, have, we're also working on cans that would ultimately replace ATB352 um, for that market. And we'll, we, we will work on those in parallel and do the, the football handoff, so to speak, at the right point in time. Uh, with So we, we, we hope to be within the next, um, uh, 12, the pandemic slows things down a bit. So it might be 15 months um, uh, into uh, humans with that, uh, with that drug. And so 12, that would be phase one, what you're saying is in 12, 15 months, you can maybe start a yes. phase one. That's correct. All right. Okay. Um, all right. And uh, what would... Uh, uh, the, the, the phase one is, is a safety measure. Uh, would that be roughly, uh, typically that's, I, I believe what a, a phase one covers is, is human safety on it. And that would be maybe a, a six months trial, something like that. Obviously you haven't designed it yet. You've got some work to do, but is that a relatively uh, not too expensive, not too complex process? Uh, that's correct. Uh, so phase ones for almost any drug um, you know, whether it's a cholesterol lowering drug or, uh, or, or, or a pain drug, uh, they're very, very similar. They are, they are, phase one is essentially uh, general overall safety in, in, um, in healthy human volunteers. And it's a dose escalation where you start off with a single dose just once at a very low dose and you escalate, then you move to um, you know, daily dosing for two weeks. Almost every drug uses a very similar study design. Um, and since you're doing this escalation, it takes about six months uh, overall. So, so you're correct in all of that. All right. Okay. And then on to your, is there anything else we should, you want to highlight on the, uh, the 352 
uh, you gave us a little overview there. Anything else that should be asked at this point or highlighted? Well, well, I, 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 I think you mentioned that the, the, this, this effort of ours is uh, going is, is to dis opioids. Opioids now uh, are, are used in the vast majority of post-operative, um, uh, you know, post-operative pain situations. And um, but it's it's at a real inflection point. I mean, you can't open up a newspaper without seeing uh, you know the, the ravages of the opioid crisis and an appreciable number of addictions to opioids started with their with a with someone's first use of of, of an opioid for post-operative pain. So it, it, that is a that seriously needs a new solution, and we're very very excited by that. So I, I just thought I'd highlight that. All right. Yeah, yeah. Opioids, obviously, a big headline and real big uh, public health issue. Uh, with your ATB three forty, the antithrombotic, anti-cancer uh, drug, that's sort of the earliest, uh, earlier uh, than the three fifty two, I believe. Can you just give us an overview, a little more of an overview on on that uh, that plan and that uh, progress potentially going there? Sure. So we're going to be wrapping up um, animal studies. We still have some more to go. Uh, and we're also working on on its follow up, which would be a completely new patent as as well, uh, because it is farther behind. But ATB three four zero is low dose aspirin. It's it's hydrogen sulfide releasing low dose aspirin. So just like the other drugs, we take a molecule of our own design that releases hydrogen sulfide, attach it to the aspirin molecule. We get a new molecule in the process. So, so new patents. Um, I mean, low-dose aspirin is a wonder drug. Um, how wonderful it is, is always open to debate. And you always see debates among doctors and scientists, but it's in the general ballpark of wonderful. Everyone agrees, um, not only for stroke um, risk reduction, which has been known for decades, but for now for cancer risk reduction in a whole series of cancers, particularly colon cancer. Um, but the problem is, is that 2% of people uh, get stomach bleeds. 2% doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're going to universally prescribe these once you're over 50 years of age, 2% is a lot. So that's what we're working on. And we have, um, uh, um, we have effort going on on that, not only on ATB340, but on its follow-up, follow-on drug as well. Okay. Yeah, because I, I personally that my doctor said I wasn't a good candidate. I shouldn't be taking my low dose aspirin because the risks outweigh the potential benefits given my thing, given and, and the risks are basically the, the bleeding issue that that could cause, right? Yeah, yeah yes, exactly. It, 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 2% of people get stomach bleeds. And I guess switching over to your platform technology, uh, with your other drugs, are you, the, this hydrogen sulfide, um, are you attaching that to sort of existing molecules like the ibuprofen molecule or like the, the aspirin molecule and, and sort of on a molecular level sort of bonding it or giving it a kind of coating or are these, or on your, on the, the three, four, six and three, five, two, are those wholly new molecules using some hydrogen sulfide uh, technology in there. So our, our general approach is used throughout. We, we take a molecule that releases hydrogen sulfide and we attach that to a, a base molecule, namely a drug that we want to improve or make safer or make it more effective. We use different donor molecules and we're, we have a whole uh, arm of research going on about that. And, and we have a collaboration with a great American university that has what we think of as one of the finest hydrogen sulfide chemists. It's not only rigorous, he's imaginative as, as well. And um, so for ATB346, 352 and 340, it uses the same molecule, but bonded to different NSAIDs. We get a new molecule, the bonded molecule gets new composition of matter patent protection and it acts like a new molecule albeit exhibiting obviously certain characteristics of the underlying base molecule. And we are now um, uh, doing that approach um, going, going forward. So we're attacking uh, inflammatory bowel disease um, in or the base molecule in that case is mesalamine. Mesalamine is uh, known to be safe, but not particularly in a rather weak drug, 
but it's it, it, it's a it, it's first line treatment for inflammatory bodies. Um, there are strong drugs for serious forms of inflammatory bowel disease, such as Remicade, but they are very expensive. And, and what's even more is that they have very um, profound side effects. And so there's, so there's a huge gap there um, before you get to that very, those very serious forms. And in studies that we have that are published, an earlier version of our, of our, mesalamine, of our H2S mesalamine drugs uh, uh, showed um, an excellent enhancing of the effectiveness of mesalamine. So uh, we've now redoubled our efforts on that. And that and, and was actually, I mentioned it earlier on in the, in, in the pitch at the beginning of this uh, conversation, uh, Martin. And um, so we're working on inflammatory bowel disease with a whole series of candidates, some 50 of them or so. And, um, and, and then we'll narrow down to one. And, um, and we've recently um, brought in, into our company um, um, Harvey Shipper, who's just a well-known uh, doctor in Canada, just a superstar, um, who is uh, who is essentially helping us prioritize the effort as to what other indications beyond inflammatory bowel disease we should um, move on to next. We have a our, we have a working list of of some fifteen areas. So very very exciting. All right, um, I've got a few questions here from the the audience here. Um, uh, when it, I'm assuming that their drug can be taken on an ongoing basis or intermittently, if that's accurate. I'm assuming the phase three would be looking at the patients taking the drug um, over a longer term basis with certain levels of dosage. But and that's what you're saying. You uh, that yes, the phase long yeah, the phase three would be yes, that's correct. The phase three trials would be daily dosing once a day. Ours is a once a day drug compared to almost all NSAIDs or twice a day drugs. But our, so an oral pill once a day, the pain studies would be for 12 months and the GI safety study would be for six months every day. And uh, someone else asks here regarding the animal data that goes out beyond two weeks. Is there anything you, else you can discuss that gives you the confidence that it will be safe and effective for the, the 12 weeks and, and beyond? Well, we've done a, a decade's worth of um, <clears throat> work beyond uh, um, of, uh, for just for two weeks, but now we have um, we are wrapping up our uh, well. We're we have done an, an, some three month studies, and we have to do six month and nine month studies, and they're in process. The, the, the same long range toxicology studies in in rats and a non rodent species that pretty much every drug uh, does. So, um, uh, so we're encouraged by the results today, but I don't yet have the final because we're, we're, uh, we'll, we'll have those things, they're sort of wrapping up now, but we're encouraged um, um, by, the, by those results. In terms of effectiveness, um, <clears throat> I, I would refer you, your reader to our, our deck. Um, we showed quite nice effectiveness at two weeks in, in humans. And um, and it's generally well known that NSAID effectiveness or separation as from placebo as it's called strengthens until week four or six and then maintains itself. So we, we, we were already already showing a strong separation at, at, at week two. So we're, 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 we're pretty confident. We don't know how low we can go though, actually our, 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 our lowest dose performed in a sense too well. So. Uh, so, so we are investigating that. That's why we're doing a, a multi-dose phase three that I mentioned. And was there evidence that the bigger the dose, the the, the higher the rates of, uh, although it was very minor, the higher the rates of ulcers in the the GI system? Was it dose dependent? Well, we have only done one um, GI safety study, and that was at two hundred and fifty milligrams, and we're. And we'll, we will be below that now because we're more effective at, at lower doses. So we only did it at 250. So we don't have human uh, dose uh, dependent relationship to ulceration. We, we do have it in animals, of course. And, and, uh, we, we, and we clearly think that that will be the case, the lower. I mean, that's certainly the case in NSAIDs. Uh, it is a dose dependent phenomenon and we would expect it to be with us. So we would expect our data to be even better than those two and a half percent that I showed you um, at lower doses. All right. 
Uh, Dan, I am running out of questions here. We're coming up to close to an, an hour on the call. Um, I can't think of anything else to ask. Are there any things you want to highlight or just uh, do you want to wrap things up here and uh, we can uh, call it a day? Well, uh, um, I would encourage you, your, your viewers to um, uh, go to our website and take a look at the full deck. Uh, we sort of make it a point of pride at, at Antibes that, uh, that we respond to every uh, shareholder inquiry or even any in inquiries and someone will get back to you if not me uh, so and and uh, obviously we live up to our not only the, the letter of the law but the spirit of the securities law so 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 uh, so all our replies are in that context but we try to be as helpful as we can and, and we encourage your readers to submit a, additional queries and and the last thing is is say thank you this has been fun and enjoyable and um, and then and, and with some uh, great great questions and uh so, so that's that's great, Martin. You know what? I just there's an I don't know if I, I, I there's another question here. Um, with your um, any progress regarding COVID research and your platform? Given COVID is there's a, some a big inflammatory issue relating to that, and you're the anti-inflammatory guys. Um, can you uh, is uh, any read through on COVID and ATE? Uh, well, we do. Um, uh, we are uh, working um, with a, lo a lot of uh, effort on COVID for exactly that reason, and we have we have had um, in our first study, which is just a test tube study, uh, we we have had um, uh, nice results. Um, so, but and, and, but I don't think that that is material because it's just the first study, and it was only a test tube study. But we were encouraged by that, so we were proceeding. Um, as fast as we can, given our uh, resources as, as a small company. Um, and we will expand that to all coronaviruses um, uh, as well. And, and, and uh, you know, thank God for the vaccines and we'll uh, eventually you know, get past uh, this, um, this point in, in human history with COVID-19, but we will be with, we will live with COVID-19 forever. So every hospital is gonna need lung inflammation uh, medicine specific to COVID. And so that's what we're going um, going after. All right. Okay. Well, that was great, Dan. Uh, lots of great answers, lots of information here. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. And um, yeah, people know where to get in touch with you guys on the, from your website if there are any further questions. So Dan, thank you very much for taking the time.